In the previous video, we saw that God appeared to Jacob in Bethel, according to Genesis 28, and even wrestled with Jacob in the guise of a man in Peniel, according to Genesis 32. In Genesis 31, which refers back to the Bethel Theophany, and Hosea 12, which refers back to both the Theophany at Bethel and Peniel, we are further told that both of these theophanic encounters directly involved that particular member of the Godhead known as the angel or messenger of the Lord during the Old Covenant. Later in the book of Genesis, we learn the same thing from a momentous comment that Jacob makes towards the end of his life. In words of invocation to God, calling down blessing upon the sons of Joseph, Jacob confirms his understanding that the angel, the Malach, whom he encountered at Bethel and Peniel, is God, even the God of his fathers. He, that is Jacob, blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. And may my name live on in them and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. There can be no question that Jacob here identifies the angel as God, for the three descriptive phrases, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who's been my shepherd all my life to this day, and the angel who redeemed me from all evil, are all joined together by a singular verb in Hebrew, may he bless, which is intentionally forestalled to the end of the sentence. The use of the singular verb ties these descriptive phrases together and identifies the angel not only as Jacob's shepherd and redeemer, which is significant in itself, but as his God and the God of his fathers, Abraham and Isaac. Since the angel is identified as the God of Abraham and Isaac, this text has a retrospective significance. It points back to earlier episodes when the angel of the Lord appeared. In all of those earlier episodes, two things may be observed about the angel. One, the angel is frequently identified as Lord or God, and two, the angel is also frequently distinguished from another person who is Lord and God. The first recorded mention of the angel of the Lord by name is found in Genesis 16, when he appeared to Hagar, Abram's concubine, as she was fleeing from the presence of Sarai, Abram's wife. Picking up the narrative in 16.7, it reads, Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man, his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live to the east of all his brothers. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God who sees me. For she said, Have I even remained alive here after seeing him? Therefore the well was called Be'er Lahai Roi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. In verses 7, 9, 10, and 11, the narrator, Moses, the author of Genesis, identifies the one who appeared to Hagar as the angel of the Lord. While the angel distinguishes himself from the Lord in verse 11, saying in the third person, The Lord has given heed to your affliction, it also indicates in numerous ways that the angel of the Lord is not a man or heavenly creature, but an appearance of God himself. In fact, while the angel of the Lord refers to the Lord as the one who has given heed to Hagar's affliction, he also makes divine promises that only God can make and fulfill. For example, in 1610, the angel said to Hagar, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. When the angel of the Lord appears to Hagar on another occasion, recorded in Genesis 21, 18, he says much the same thing. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him by the hand, for I will make a great nation of him. 
These promises of the angel of the Lord to Hagar to bring forth a multitude of descendants from Ishmael and to make them a great nation are clearly divine promises, promises that only God can make. Indeed, in the very next chapter, 1720, this is the same thing God tells Abraham. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you, behold, I will bless him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. In addition to making divine promises, because the angel is a divine person, and everything is laid open and bare before his gaze, he tells Hagar that she has a child in her womb, orders her to name him Ishmael, and tells her the nature and future course of her child, namely that he'll be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand will be against everyone. The weight and tenor of this encounter led Hagar to conclude that the angel she was speaking with was God. According to verse 13, at the conclusion of the episode, it says, Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God who sees me. For she said, Have I even remained alive after seeing him? Hagar is specifically referring to the one who spoke to her, and she names him El Roi, which means the God who sees me. And in commemoration of the angel of the Lord appearing to her by a well, the place came to be called Be'er Lahai Roi, which means the well of the living one who sees me. Moreover, what Hagar says in verse 13 is preceded by the words of the narrator, in this case Moses. When Hagar says, you are a God who sees me, these follow the prefatory comments of Moses, who wrote, Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. So Hagar refers to the angel of the Lord as the God who sees me, and Moses refers to him as the Lord, or Yahweh, in the Hebrew text. In addition to the angel appearing to Hagar, Genesis 22 tells us that the angel of the Lord appeared to Abraham in the famous incident known as the Akita, or binding of Isaac. In Genesis 22, God tested Abraham, telling him to take Isaac, the child of promise, and offer him up to God as a sacrifice. After arriving at Mount Moriah, ascending the mountain, binding Isaac to the altar, and on the cusp of Abraham preparing to slay Isaac, verses 11 and 12 say, But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad, and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Once again, the angel is simultaneously distinguished from someone called God and identified as God. In verse 12, the angel of the Lord distinguishes himself from God by saying, Now I know that you fear God, referring to God in the third person. But in the same breath, he identifies himself as God, first by countermanding the divine order to slay Isaac, do not stretch out your hand against the lad, and by saying that Isaac was being offered up to him. You have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Subsequent to this, in verses 15 through 18, the angel makes an oath to Abraham and swears by himself that he will perform it. Namely, that he will greatly bless Abraham, multiply his seed, cause them to possess the gate of their enemies, and through Abram's seed to bring blessing upon all the nations of the earth. And the reason the angel says he will do all of this, as verse 18 says, is because you have obeyed my voice. A final example of the angel of the Lord appearing to the patriarchs is seen in Genesis 26. Although this text does not use the title, the angel of the Lord, and simply says that God appeared to Isaac, the words of God to Isaac make it clear that he is the same one who appeared to Isaac's father Abraham in Genesis 22. In chapter 26, verses 1 through 5, it says, Now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants I will give all these lands, 
and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and will give your descendants all these lands, and by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. In verse 2, it simply tells us that it was the Lord who appeared to Isaac. However, in the course of speaking to Isaac, the Lord identifies himself in verse 3 as the one who will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham, precisely because, as verse 5 says, Abraham obeyed me. Accordingly, since the angel of the Lord is the one Abraham obeyed and who swore an oath to bless Abraham in Genesis 22, this text, Genesis 26, is an appearance of the angel of the Lord to Isaac. And here he is straightforwardly called the Lord, or Yahweh. All of the foregoing is why Jacob, in Genesis 48, in blessing his descendants, could say that the angel, who was his shepherd and the one who redeemed him, is the same God before whom Abraham and Isaac walked. The God of the patriarchs was not unipersonal, and the patriarchs were not Unitarians. They recognized that the angel of the Lord, along with the Holy Spirit already mentioned in Genesis 1, is a distinct member of the Godhead. As we'll see in the next video, the same thing was revealed and made known to the entire nation of Israel at the time of the Exodus.